The title of the talk today is A Yes Face. So, someone passed this along to me, a Cajun named Jean-Paul moved to Texas and brought a donkey from our old farmer for $100. The farmer agreed to deliver the donkey the next day. The next day, the farmer drove up and said, sorry, I have some bad news. That donkey died. Cajun said, well, then just give me my money back. Can't do it, already spent it. Okay, then just unload the donkey. What are you going to do with a dead donkey? I'm going to raffle it off. You can't raffle off a dead donkey. Sure I can. Watch me. I just won't tell anybody he's dead. Farmer, a month later, the farmer met up with a Cajun and asked, what happened with that dead donkey? I raffled it off. I sold 500 tickets for $2 each and made a profit of $898. He said, did anyone complain? He said, yeah, just the guy who won, so I gave him his $2 back. <laughs> Okay, uh, <laughs> that's a good, I'm not sure if that was gracious or not, but anyway, if there was one word that I want to focus on today, one word, and this is what I'm, we're going to do the time we have, I'm going to focus on the word grace, and there are a lot of different definitions and, and ideas that people have. When you hear the word grace, sometimes people look at that as an empty concept or empty term or empty word, uh, but it's much more than that. But the question I had to ask myself, and I'll ask you now, is have you ever had a meeting or an appointment with somebody that deeply impacted your life? Have you ever had a meeting with somebody? Maybe it was planned, maybe it was unexpected, not planned but had a deep impact on your life. And I started writing down eight or ten things, and I'm not going to go over them today, but eight or ten uh, examples of people over the years that I've had the occasion to be with that literally made a gigantic change in my life. And so, um, you know, it's interesting as we think about grace and, and all the things that I'm going to try to define in a moment that can come our way um, especially those for you in this room who claim to be followers of Christ, became the two, claim to be followers of Jesus. So I'm thinking uh, that a lot of times we've got a lot of men who uh, are good men, and they do have a legitimate relationship with Christ. Uh, they do some good things, but you can get a point to a point in your life, younger, middle-aged, even older, where you become a little uh, sluggish, you begin uh, kind of staying on the bench too long. And I love a little passage over in the book of um, Hebrews. By the way, did you know that uh, coffee is mentioned in the Bible? Hebrews? Okay, but anyway, <laughs> in Hebrews chapter 6, our great desire is that you will keep on loving others, it's talking to people that follow Jesus, as long as life lasts, in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then he says this, then you will not become spiritually dull, indifferent, or sluggish. And when a person is touched by the grace of God through the person of Jesus and an encounter with him, your chances of getting sluggish ever again are minimized. So I think the one thing that can keep us back is not to have a, leg a legitimate touch of the grace of God in your life. So the question is, what is grace? A man was asked that one day, what is grace? He said, grace is a blue-eyed blonde. That's not a bad one. So what is grace? How would you define it? I was looking up some examples of that. So a ballet dancer. Often, they, they're a, they, when they dance, they were full of grace. I can't dance. I really, I love to dance. I hear the music. I got it going. I'm moving, usually with nobody around. But one night, Punky and I, were, I was speaking out at the Gaylord when I was working with the Cowboys, and we had one of our little studies with a, about 25 or 30 of the players. And when it was over, Punky went up to one of the guys, one of the black players, and said, would you please help John learn how to dance? He looked at her and said, can't do it. He's too white. 
but I am. I'm the best from the neck up anyway. I mean, I can move that neck. I can get that thing going, but man, we get no grace from me. Sometimes we think of grace as a prayer before a meal, or we think of a, a person like the Queen of England coming in at any meeting and bringing a sense of grace, or we think of a great actress from the past, Grace Kelly. So whatever it is, grace, um, grace is a big deal. So the question to you today is this. What do you understand about grace? Have you experienced his grace? Has grace changed you at all? Have you been freed up in your life from habits, from addictions, from being fearful and be able to just to become the person God made you to be? Have you freed others up and moved dis, uh, uh, expectations out of the way and just care for the person like they were? So someone passed, again, I, I love, anytime you got good jokes, this is not a joke, but pass it along to me. It seems, uh, and this was in a cartoon character, a dominant aggressive type is uh, talking to a friend who happens to be quiet or quieter or more passive. With an unhesitating boldness, a stronger one says to the weaker one, if I were in charge of the world, I'd change everything. A bit intimidated, the friend who forced, was forced to listen said meekly, well, what would, what, well, that wouldn't be easy. Like, where would you start? And with absolutely no grace at all, the guy looks at him and said, I'd start with you. Well, you know, a lot of times we've got a lot of people like that. They are what I call grace killers. They don't, anytime you, anytime you point your finger at somebody else, you need to remember there are three pointing back at you. And so the, the advice of this book is always start with you first and then take out the, the, uh, the stone or the pebble in your, bu in your buddy's eye. So if I were in charge, if I were in charge, that's what he said. If you ever encounter the grace of God, my belief is you'll never be the same again. And grace, when it does its work, it's amazing. So I took a piece of paper out the other day, and I just wrote down all the things that I think I've seen in my life, some of these, not all these, but also in the lives of others who've had a legitimate encounter with the living Christ. Uh, they're more tender. They're grateful. They're gracious. They're sensitive. They're caring. They're giving. They're compassionate. They're committed. They're humble, they're teachable, they're kind, and we're going to look at that one today. They're, they're patient, they're loving, they, 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 they have been pardoned, and when they've been pardoned and forgiven, they forgive others easily. They don't hold grudges. Uh, they're grace-filled. They have a power to live a different kind of life. This person that's experienced this grace, they seem to have a, a purpose in life. Uh, I don't know why it is, but when people are seeking for a purpose, they always have to go to Aspen, try to find themselves. I don't know why they have to find themselves up there. But anyway, a grace-filled person has a sense of wisdom and direction in their life. They're not always floundering around trying to figure stuff out. So we're going to look at one man and another man that he encountered. And I call this a gracious encounter. In 2 Samuel 9, and let me give you a little background here. We're talking about King David. And as you look back, this is, if you look, read 1 Samuel, it's like 3,000 years before. It's a brutal period of, of dynasties and kings of Israel and so forth. Uh, and these, these are, if you don't want to read this book, just go to your history book and you'll read basically what I'm telling you. So what would happen when a new dynasty would come in, new leadership would come in, unlike corporations today, uh, all the family of the previous king were exterminated. So, you know, that, these people weren't playing around. This was tough business. So the former family members constantly lived in fear. They had no idea if they were going to be next or not. So King Saul and his son, Jonathan, both died in a battle. And you can read about this in, in 2 Samuel. So now, even though he was tapped at a very young age, now with Saul and Jonathan gone, he is now the king. So David's leadership takes hold. He's a great leader. He had a few soft spots, and that's not our subject today, but he was a great leader. So now he's in middle age. 
he's kind of recounting some of the things in the country under his leadership that have happened. He's in a re- very reflective mood, and he remembers, as he is reflecting, a promise that he had made. And the promise that he had made uh, was to Jonathan, the son of Saul, uh, and that's what he started thinking about. So in 2 Samuel 9, 1 through 4, we're going to look at a couple verses there. And the first thing that just pops up like that is this king, David, even though he was tough and a great leader, he had a tender heart. You know, somebody told me years ago, a guy that had a great impact on my life, he said, a leader has to have a tough hide but a tender heart. A tough hide. Because you're going to encounter stuff when you're a leader. You're going to get kicked on and hit at. So you got to have a tough hide but a tender heart or you'll bail out under that pressure. So kindness. So there's a better translation than the word kindness here, and it's mercy or grace. Let me give you a thought. Grace is a positive acceptance in spite of the other person. It is a demonstration of love that is not deserved and can never be repaid. So in verse 1, David asked, Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So he, the, a promise had been made between Jonathan and Saul, um, excuse me, Jonathan and David. They had a close relationship. And the promise was, that, at least from David's side, when it's all over, when you're gone, when I'm the king, I will not exterminate your family. So he's reflecting back on that. And he says, is there anyone left in the, in, in the household of Saul uh, that uh, I need to know about? So he looks back and he comes up with a candidate. And you're going to see who the candidate is in a moment as he says this man's name. But then he says to him, now there was a servant in Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba, your servant? He said, I am. The king asked, is there anyone left in the house of Saul to whom I can show my kindness? So the first thing I want you to see is, he just says anyone there. He doesn't say, he doesn't give a profile. He doesn't give a curriculum vitae. Here's what they got to have. He doesn't uh, have any qualification. He said anyone there. Is he worthy? He didn't say, is he worthy? Is he fit? Does he fit in to the palace life here? Uh, Would he bring life to the table when we have a meal at the king's table? He didn't do that. Now notice this, that David, the great king, sought out and went after somebody in the household of Saul. An amazing thing. So what was the report? Ziba said yes, and this is unreal. Ziba said, and if you look down, hopefully it's on the screen, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is just a cripple. Just a cripple. Now, some people in our society would look at a cripple and say, "Uh, I'm so sorry, but they just don't fit. And I'm going to tell you about a friend of mine that was a cripple. But he said, no, just a cripple. Now, David, David, think about it. If you look at the scripture and see, he doesn't hesitate. He doesn't reconsider. He doesn't say, find somebody else. He says, where is he? Where is he? And it's an amazing thing about the scripture. The scripture tells us that God came in Jesus Christ to seek and to save the lost. A lot of us, for whatever reasons, have a fear in our heart that God's mad at us. Now, here's the amazing thing. God knows everything about you and me. Everything. Everything. And he's not mad at you. He's not mad. What we need to understand, grace doesn't get mad. Grace heals. Grace helps. Grace makes a person become whole, complete. And so, where is he? Well, Grace is like that. Grace isn't picky. Grace doesn't look for accomplishments that deserve love. Grace is, operates apart from the response or the ability of the individual. Grace is one-sided. Are you that kind of person? 
Are you a kind, grace-filled person? Are you? Sometimes, again, like I said earlier, we think it's a weak sign of weakness to be kind. So we got to be tough and gruff and rough. Let me tell you something. A real man can be soft and tender and kind. And when a man is not tender, it doesn't mean you can't be firm, but fair. But toughness often illustrates in a man's life that they don't like themselves. They're not comfortable in their own skin. They're still, not, they're still trying to prove something. And so when here's the great king, he's got nothing to prove. And he's kind. He's gracious. He's looking out for somebody else. He's looking to be kind. Do you take the initiative towards people to be kind? Do you go, when's the last time you've gone to somebody and said, what can I do for you? What do you need? I think sometimes we don't do that because they might need something (laughs) and we really don't mean it. What do you need? What is it, has anybody ever just out of nowhere said, what do you need? Can I help you? How'd that make you feel? So years ago, I had a friend who's with the Lord now. He was a pastor in Washington, D.C. Last eight years of his life, he was a chaplain for the United States Senate. His name was Dick Halverson, a legend in that part of the country and around the world, especially with leaders and men and people of other cultures from all over the world. And so in his, as when he was a pastor, it was a big church in D.C., and he pulled all of his leaders together, uh, his elders, the deacons, the different churches have different uh, lay leaders, but he said, all right, I want one of you to take each one of the staff people, and I want you to at least once or twice a year Get a meeting with them, take them to lunch, and ask them, how are you doing? What do you need? Your family okay? Because if you're on a staff of a company or a church or whatever, you don't want to go knocking on the door, I need this, I need that, because they might fire you. Oh, they're, they're always whining, they always want something else. If you set it up, whereas those who experience his grace see people around us that he leads us to, we go, what can I do for you? What can I do? And you know, someone told me years ago, a man, I must have been a teenager, he said, listen, the happiest people are people that do, are doing something for somebody else. You want to be happy? Then, then don't clutch things. Give yourself. The greatest thing you can give anybody is your time. But sometimes it will lead to some other things. So grace is giving himself in full acceptance to someone who does not deserve it and can never earn it and will never be able to repay it. There it is again. So where is this this cripple from? Well, the scripture says, and let's go down to verse number, um, uh, number five. It says, so King David had him brought from a place called Lodabar. Now, Lodabar was not a bar. It was not a lounge. It was a location. So it was not a bar. He said, that's where he's from. Now, what does low, low de bar mean? Low, it means it was a place that had no pasture. It was a place that was barren. And so this, this cripple lived in a barren place. You say, what's that got to do with me? Let me ask you something. You ever been in a barren place? In your marriage? In your career? In your life, some of you right now are barren. So how do you how do you survive and thrive through and out of a barren barrenness in your life? I know a lot of people. They said I used to read it, but I don't read it anymore. That's barren, dry, and we can all go through those stages. We need to understand that. And so he said, "So where is he? Where is he?" And he said, "What well, he's in Lodabar. The cripple was hiding." In a barren place. And I don't know about you, over my lifetime, when I've been in a barren place, it's not a whole lot of fun. I don't like to be in barren places. So how did he get crippled? How did this happen that this Mephibosheth, and you may not, that's his name, Mephibosheth, know the history behind it. But but here's what it says in Samuel, chapter number 4, 
it says that there was uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son, Mephibosheth, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came uh, from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as he, she hurried away, she dropped him, and he became crippled. So there's a history behind it. He was crippled. And that's nothing of his fault, but he was crippled. And then, if you look at the passage again, he asks, where is he? He was seeking him out. It takes effort. It takes energy from all of us to seek people out. And every day there are people around you that whether they are seeking you out or not is not the question. But do you have your sensitivity Open, and are you looking? Who could I encourage today? Who could I ask, how are you doing today? I'm telling you, it, we could change this city if we had a group of people that live like that. And there's some of you who do. Some of you do to do that. So uh, he's just a cripple. Well, what can a cripple do? Well, let's go on. Let's look at the plan of action. Chapter number five, or excuse me, chapter number uh, nine, verse five. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, <clears throat> son of Emil. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, <clears throat> came to David, he bowed down and paid him honor. So he, he appears before the great king. Can you imagine the chariot ride? Somebody had to lift him up, get him in the chariot, and they are headed off to the king's uh, palace. And can you imagine the apprehension? Can you imagine... All the things that drifted across his mind, his shame, his disabilities. As, can you imagine? So he comes before the king and appears before the king. And so he hears the rejected, the cripple, the, the lost, the forgotten, the seemingly unimportant in front of the king. We're lost. We're rejected a lot of times by ourselves and others. We're often feeling like we're unimportant. And yet we get a chance to get to know the king. We're flawed, we're broken, but we get a chance to know the king. And so what a moment. Imagine how he, imagine the emotions. But he knew that this was the king, and the first thing he did is he bowed down. You know, there's something, when you understand that there's someone greater than you, that the Lord is greater than all of us, whether you're a Christian or not, to heal, still have respect for the Creator is a big deal. Bow down. And so what happened? He said, the great king called his name. And if you look at in verse number 6, David said, Mephibosheth. He called his name. You know, um, I love it when my name's called. Not when I, for my birthday today. I mean, I appreciate that, but I was trying to hide from this one. But anyway, uh, when somebody calls your name years ago, so am I going to make the starting five? Did they call my name? And am I going to make the traveling squad? Did they call my name? Did I get the scholarship? Did they say, John, did they call my name? When somebody calls your name, that means they know you. They're not rejecting you. They care. They're interested. They want to know you. Do they know your name? Well, let me tell you something right now. Whether you like it or not or know it or not, he knows your name. He knows your name. He knows everything about you and me. He knows it all. And he says, and kind of my way of saying it is, I got a deal for you. He's the king. So David, I believe, as we look through this, had what I call a yes face. Someone said it this way, what grace is in your heart, your hope is to release others from fear, not create it. There are some people you can be around that you know, maybe even in this room, when you're around them, you're just uneasy around them. You don't know what they think about you. And sometimes that can be unnerving. Do you know the number one word that re was repeated in the Bible over and over and over again that God said? Fear not. Fear not. And a lot of us live with fears. 
fears of what people think about us, fears of the future, fears are we going to be able to handle things. Uh, so fears, we need to understand. So I believe that David had a yes face. People who have experienced grace have a yes face. You're, you're, you're not afraid to talk with them, to talk about things that are important. They had a willingness to give you a, 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 a face that says, uh, I, I care about you. I'm interested in you. So what's the key's response? He looks at Mephibosheth and he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And I love what uh, Carl Menninger from the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, I think it's still located there. He said this, Dr. Carl Menninger. By the way, one of the things Carl Menninger said years ago, he said 70 to 75% of the people in mental hospitals today could be released if they could experience a forgiveness of their sin and a relief of their shame and guilt. What guilt, and we all have it, and shame, we carry it. If we don't have a way to deal with it that's appropriate through him, it can eat our lunch. It can debilitate us. It can suck creativity out of our lives. So he says here, in a book called The Vital Balance, at one point discusses the negative, the negative personality. That's the type who says no to just about everything, calling these sad folks troubled patients. Menninger, no doubt, with tongue in cheek, mentions several of the things that characterize their lives. They have never made an unsound loan, voted for a liberal cause, or sponsored any extravagances. Why? He suggests it's because they cannot permit themselves the pleasure of giving. He describes them in vivid terms. Rigid, chronically unhappy individuals. Bitter, insecure, and often suicidal. So how would people describe you? How would your wife describe you if you're married? How would your children and your grandchildren describe you? Do these people enjoy being around you? So again, we put a lot of barriers up. And to illustrate this even further, during his days as president, Thomas Jefferson and a group of companions were traveling across the country on horseback. They came to a river which had left its banks because of uh, a recent downpour. The swollen river had washed the bridge away. Each rider was forced to ford the river over horseback fighting for his life against the rapid currents. The very real possibility of death threatened each one, which caused a traveler, a traveler, not with, us, with the troops, who was not part of that group, to step aside and watch. After several had plunged in and made it to the other side, the stranger asked President jo uh, Jefferson if he would ferry him across the river on his horse. The president agreed. <clears throat> the man climbed on shortly afterward. The two of them made it safely to the other side. As the stranger slid off the back of his saddle into the, onto the ground, one in the group asked him, Tell me, why did you select the president to ask this favor of? The man was shocked, admitting he had no idea it was the president. And all I know, he said, is this, is that on some of your faces was written, No. And on some of them was written, Yes. The president had a yes face. Do you have a yes face? The way you get a yes face is the grace of God through Jesus Christ touches your heart. Your heart is your mind, your will, and your emotions, not your pumper. He changes us from the inside out. Are you allowing him to do that? Are you allowing him to work on you? So in verse number eight, we see the privilege uh, that's provided here. Uh, verse 8, Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? A dead dog like me. So uh, it, was not a, a, it was not a place of a privilege for this young Mephibosheth who was, a critical, who, was, uh, who was crippled. So again, what happened? Well, he said, um, not leave me alone. He did not say, You're no, you don't fit the, the context in which we're in here. He said, I'm going to give you something that will change your life. And Mephibosheth, listen to this, was unknown, of no consequence to the king, crippled in both feet, nothing to give to the benefit of the kingdom, zero appeal, yet David stooped in grace to this nobody. Often, my wife and I often say when we go to a restaurant, 
you can often tell how a person is by how they treat those that wait on them. And I had a man a number of years ago, he's dead now, uh, and I was with him a lot, very powerful man in our country and beyond. And every time we sit down, I felt uneasy because I didn't know how he was going to treat the waiters. He was always impatient. He was always demanding. I got it now. I had my hand up. Why didn't you come over? I mean, it was embarrassing. And so a gracious person is not like that. So David does not respond. He simply sits there. And can you imagine? Can you imagine? And he goes on to say, from that time on, Mephibosheth ate at the king's table. So can you imagine? Can you imagine the first time they put him up on that seat behind the king's table? All these people around. And I kind of looked up some of the people that probably could have been there. Well, there was David, the king, at the head of the table. There's Amon, who was clever and crafty. Tamar, a charming and beautiful young woman. Solomon, who was brilliant and a great writer and was to be a great leader. There was Absalom, and then there was Joab, who was the head of all of the David's troops. So can can imagine this now. After they wait and are ready for dinner, they hear the shuffling feet. Clump, clump, clump of the crutches. As Mephibosheth rather awkwardly finds his place at the table and slips in his seat, and the tablecloth covers his crooked feet. And I ask you, did, do you think Mephibosheth understood grace? I had a buddy, Lee was his name, <clears throat> Lee Sizemore. He died again a couple years ago up in Nashville. Lee Sizemore, when I was in college over a summer, I was in the gym getting ready to play some ball. And this guy says hi to me from behind me. And I look around, he's a guy in a wheelchair. And nice as he could be, and he said, I'm putting a team together, a bunch of college guys. Would you like to play? We're going to travel around the state. And I said, sign me up. I used to get uneasy at first with him because I'd have to pick him up everywhere we went. And that meant I was putting a cripple in my car. That meant I had to fold up his chair and get it in my trunk. And especially when other people are around, I felt kind of awkward about that, a little uneasy. And as I look back, as I look back at it now, I really honestly feel ashamed of myself that I felt that way. This guy was a great man. There's a, a, there's a wonderful writer. If you ever go to a, a Christian bookstore, look online. To, books for mainly women around the world. Beth Moore is a writer. She's written I don't know how many books. Punky Studyman. Many of your wives, I'm sure, have studied them over the years. And so he came to her one day, they became friends, and said, you know, we need to put together this deal where you have videos, and the videos go along with the book, and they can watch the video, then get together with other people and watch them and discuss the the study. My buddy Lee Sizemore did all that. His name is in the front of that book, impacting people all over the world. So about a week or two before he died, I got up uh, to Nashville. I drove up there, actually, and... Went to his home. His wife greeted me. He's lying and propped up in a hospital bed in his house. And he was never able to walk. He had crutches. He was born with a disease that from birth he could not walk. So he's, he's got a kind of a tray that they, he could pull up. So he's got his uh, laptop there. And now he's got, he said, just a few days from dying. A cripple. And I said, Lee. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, man, there's some guy over in Mississippi, and he wants to get the gospel all over the country, and I'm working on this deal for him. He was going out. Man, that's the way I want to go out. I want to go out doing something for him, and I hope you feel that same way. And so, again, uh, Lee Sizemore. Well, let me kind of close this up in the last six or seven minutes uh, and give you some thoughts on this. Let me give you... Some conclusions, first of all, then I want to read a story, and then we're out of here. So the first thing I want us to be reminded of is we look at Mephibosheth, the cripple, Lee Sizemore, the cripple. God did a number through him and on him. He's with the Lord now. We're all cripples. There's not a man, including me, in the room does not have, that does not have a limp. We're all crippled. And in the society in which we live, whether it's uh, South Lake or Highland Park, the park cities or 
depressed and how, wherever you are, there are cripples. And so what we do to keep up the front is we caulk and paint the cracks so no one will see the cracks. We all have cracks. And when we talk like this, it makes us nervous because I hope nobody knows my cracks. He knows, and I know generally, because we all have cracks. And so we hide hurts, we bury and carry secrets, we disguise the limp, but we're crippled. Second thing is God loves cripples. He, he's got a thing for crippled people, and we're crippled. We may be unlovable, but we are not unloved. You are deeply loved whether you know it or not or acknowledge it or not. God created you out of love. The scripture says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us, listen, in that while we were crippled, he came and gave his life for us. Not when we got ourselves all cleaned up and didn't have a limp anymore because we can't do that. At our worst, he gave us his best. Here's another one. He knows how crippled we are, and he knows the areas in which we are crippled. And at the right time, in all of our crippledness, he came and gave us his son. So, how do I get uncrippled? You know, one of the passages of Scripture I think we need to be reminded of today is from Ephesians chapter 2. I cannot make myself uncrippled. I cannot deal with my own flaws and sin. I can't do it. No one can do that. That's why Paul, the great Jew, the great Jew says in Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works or keeping the laws, lest anybody brag or boast. So it doesn't come through, so it doesn't, you don't get it through the family plan or through the genes that's passed down. Every person's got to stand before him and be willing to cry, uncle, or suffer the consequences if we don't. We can't get there on our own. Someone said, never trust a man who doesn't have a limp. We all have limps. So if we're faking it, I'd rather know what the limp is so we can move on and not let somebody blindside us at the wrong moment. So let me close with this and... Uh, this is kind of long. It lasts about a minute, minute and a half. All depends how fast I read. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> At the University of Chicago Divinity School, each year they would have what they called Baptist Day, whatever that is. On this day, each one is to bring a lunch to eat outdoors in a grassy picnic area, and they would invite one of the great communicator speakers from around the world. One year, they invited a, a man named Dr. Paul Tillich, and I used to have to read some of his stuff when I was in graduate school. I wasn't a big fan of his, but anyway, he was there. Dr. Tillich spoke for two and one half hours, proving that the resurrection of Jesus was false. He quoted scholar after scholar and book after book. He concluded that since there was no such thing as a historical resurrection, he believed, uh, the religious tradition of the church was groundless, emotional, mumbo-jumbo because it was based on a relationship with a risen Jesus who, in fact, never rose from the dead in any literal sense, he believed. He then asked if there were any questions. After about 30 seconds, an old, dark-skinned preacher with a head of short-cropped, woolly white hair stood up in the back of the auditorium. Dr. Tillich, I got one question, he said as all eyes turned towards him. He reached into his sack lunch and pulled out an apple and began to eat it. Dr. Tillich, crunch, crunch. My question is a simple question, crunch, munch. Now, I ain't never read them books you read, crunch, munch, and I can't recite the scriptures in the original Greek, crunch, crunch, I don't know nothing about Niebuhr and Heidegger, crunch, crunch. He finished the apple. All I want to know is one thing. This apple I just ate, was it bitter or sweet? Dr. Tillich paused for a moment and answered in exemplary scholarly fashion. I cannot possibly answer that question, for I haven't tasted your apple. 
The white-haired old preacher dropped the core of the apple into his sack, looked up at Dr. Tillich and said, neither have you ever tasted of Jesus. When you taste Jesus, you know it and others will know it. And when you taste of the grace of Jesus in your life, you will always have a yes face. Let's pray. Lord, if we could only get it in our heads and hearts, in every part of our being, of how much you love us and want to, to invade our lives and to help us to become like you've always wanted us to be from the very beginning, the kind of men you wanted us to be. And Lord, you know what a real man's like. And in our day and time, we have so many counterfeit men. But you make authentic men. And the only way we can become a real man is to have you living in our lives. So some of you might be saying as a visitor today, how do I do that? You just say, Lord, come into my life. That's what he said to do in the scripture. Invite him in and say, clean me up. Help me to become the man you want me to be. You can do that right now, just quietly. Come into my life. And the promise is he will come in. And there are men in this room who've done that over the years. And their lives are changing. So I pray you'll do that. I pray you will. I can't make you. I pray you will. And then there are men here in the room that love you, Lord. And we need to have more of a yes face developed in and through us. Some of us need to say, Lord, I am in a barren place in a different area of my life. And I need you to refresh me. I need you to do something new in me. Help me to stand up straight, look people in the eyes, and not duck people, and not duck opportunities for you. And maybe that needs to be your prayer. And Lord, I want to thank you for the men here that are, do have a yes face and are making a difference for you. So Lord, we're living in a crazy world. And we need real men. Men that you make, authentic filled with your power and life and message. And I pray that their tribe may increase. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, fellas, we'll see you next week. <laughs>